Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Rebecca Sofer. I run Modern Loss, which is in, in real life an online global community that helps people through the long arc of grief and loss and finding each other and pulling each other along the way. Um, I'm delighted to be the host of 1-800-Flowers-Light-After-Loss series on Facebook. We have been going strong for more than two years. Every month I sit down with a different expert in the field of grief and loss or in resilience, building mental health, rituals, creativity, therapeutic mechanisms. And, you know, we talk about it all and we talk about it against the backdrop of the reality that not every single floral arrangement that's sent in life. Not every single plant, not every single delivery of chocolates is for a celebration. Life is life, life happens. And 1-800-Flowers team, one of the reasons I love working with them is they are more than aware that life is very bittersweet, that there's a lot of dark that coexists along with the light, that we are frequently missing somebody or something on the very same day when we're maybe celebrating someone or something else. And so that's why I really enjoy being able to play around in this space with you every month, because I feel like um, a lot of you get it. And we're living in great times of loss. And if we don't talk about it, we don't feel acknowledged in it. And if we don't feel acknowledged in it, then it's pretty hard to feel like we're healing. So that's what we're here to do today. Uh, thanks again for joining. And today is April 11th, which is National Pet Day in the United States, maybe even globally. I did not do, I did not do that extent of research on that. But National Pet Day, I mean, like, what can I say? Like, happy National Pet Day. I mean, like, pets are the best, you know, like, they're the best. I, I I like saying pets are people too, but in my opinion, they're kind of better than people. Um, my first pet was Schultz. He Schultz, actually, he was a beagle. I was um, five years old. He was an adorable beagle that my parents got. Uh, and my current pet is Ziggy, uh, who I wanted to name David Bowie, but I was outvoted by my husband. So we settled on Ziggy and she's a 12 year old Labradoodle. And um, she has gotten me through some of the hardest times of my life. And I love her very much. And I am here to talk about pet bereavement today. Because as much as, you know, we're here to celebrate our pets, we're also here to celebrate our pets' memories. And the fact that as pet owners and pet parents, we don't cease being those after our pets die. Um, around 67% of American households, that's about 84.9, almost 85 million homes in the United States own some sort of pet, according to the American Pet Products Association. And despite the inevitable loss that comes with owning a pet, uh, the ways that people grieve a pet that dies are not taken as seriously in general as they are when we're grieving a person that dies. And I, I know that very well. I, I you know, I've, I've seen it myself. I've heard people say, you know, I don't know why they're so upset. Their dog just died. They can just get another one. I, I've, many of my friends have said such a thing, you know, like, and they're not bad people. They just, you know, maybe aren't pet people. Uh, but I think those of us who are pet people are aware that you don't, no one knows the depths of the relationship that a person has with their pet. When Modern Loss launched as a website in 2013, one of our first articles was written by a woman who was writing about her dog, Sal, who had died. And she wrote about how when Sal died, everyone was like, well, that's really sad. You can get another dog, but like, that's sad. But you know, like, it was just a dog. And she said, well, what people didn't know about Sal is that he literally kept me alive for 15 years. And she talks about how she had lupus and it's an extraordinary, pain, extraordinarily painful disease. Sometimes she didn't even wanna get out of bed in the morning, but Sal made her. Sal still had to go out, Sal, Sal still had to play fetch, Sal still had to go on walks. And for 15 years, this dog kept her healthy, upright and moving even during the times when she didn't feel like she could keep going on. And so I give that example to make any of you out there who are missing pets so very much feel seen because you never know the depths of a relationship with, you know, between a person and a pet. And I wanna honor that today in this space.
Um, and so throughout our episode, I want you to feel free to comment, uh, to ask questions. Please post them on Facebook. My guest and I are going to be coming back to everything and answering them after the episode. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, our expert today, E.B. Bartels. Uh, she is a nonfiction writer. She is a Grub Street instructor, which is a writing program in the Boston area, if I'm correct. Um, and she has an MFA from Columbia University. And she has a beautiful book called Good Grief on Loving Pets Here and Hereafter. It's a narrative nonfiction book about loving and losing animals. And she is coming to us from Massachusetts, where she lives with her husband and their many, many, many pets. So first of all, Evie, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about some of our favorite beings on Earth. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. And I'm I'm so happy to, you know, be in connection with Modern Loss and the 1-800 Flowers Light After Loss series. It just, it's so important to me to talk about, you know, these beings that we love. And even if they're no longer around, you know, they're still part of our lives, even long after their deaths. They really are. And first and foremost, what would you say to somebody who you felt didn't get it? Like those people who I have heard saying, I don't know why they're so upset. Like they can just get another cat or turtles die or whatnot. What What would you say? Like if you could just say one thing to that person to help them to understand, what would it be? Well, I mean, I think it depends. If I, if, if I hear someone say something like that about someone else who's grieving, I feel like then I have a moment to kind of talk to that person and say, you know, maybe you don't, don't understand why they have been attached to this particular being, this particular creature, but you've probably experienced some sort of loss in your life, right? You've probably loved someone who has died. Um, you've maybe gone through a breakup or a divorce, or you've had to move. There are all kinds of ways we can experience loss, right? So even if you maybe don't get why someone is so attached to a cat, you can at least maybe try to imagine another time you have felt that loss and put yourself in that person's shoes. Um, though if I'm the person who's grieving and someone says that to me, or if you know somebody who has been grieving tells me that they've had a comment like that, my advice is just let it go and find someone else to talk to because you don't need to waste your time trying to convince someone um, you know, why your, your love and grief for your animal is so valid. Instead, there are millions of people out there who have gone through it, who get it. And it's such a beautiful um, community I have found of people who can really connect and relate through the loss of their pets. Um, let it be through pet loss, um, you know, like healing circles, or, um, you know, there's a beautiful monthly uh, pet uh, ministry service that happens on Zoom where people share their stories, or even just posting on Facebook, right? And, you know, you can put photos of your pet up and people can comment and share their own memories of your pet. And, you know, don't waste your time, I think, with people who don't get it. Um, right. Look for the people who, who... In general, that's my advice in life yeah. to people. <laughs> But it's not always so easy to put into practice, but yeah. it's true. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, and I actually learned this from your book, you know, about 85 million homes in the United States have a pet. So chances are it's like more people than not understand they're your people. Um, but it is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is, I think, quite easy for people when they're when their pets die to feel very unseen, to feel very alone, even though they know that there are other pet people out there. You know, um, there is this like individual grief experience that, you know, it doesn't have to be isolating, but it is highly individualized, you know, like no one else has those memories and no one will ever get it. In this culture, we don't have go-to morning rituals for pets right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot for humans in every, a lot of religions, a lot of cultures, but for pets, we're kind of left to like, you know, maybe there are pet cemeteries or like, maybe we can like look online and get ideas. Um, tell me a little bit about what you've discovered about like how people can creatively find a ritual that's resonant with them that connects them to their pet. Because what I have learned is that ritual is, is this very mindful place where we go to 
to find that connection after a loss. And it involves a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. So I, I'm really glad you asked that because I think the lack of having set rituals can be really stressful, honestly. And I think can make morning pets sometimes harder because you don't mm. have the comfort of those things that you know what to do. But I also think it's really freeing because you can really do whatever you want and whatever feels most appropriate and fitting and right for you and the pet that you're honoring. Um, and I think that's really a special thing that you can kind of do whatever you want. So I, I have found through my research that often a lot of people will sort of adapt things that they do for people for their animals, because that's what they know, that's what they're comfortable with. And it makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, if you're kind of at a loss for what to do, you think, okay, you know, we had a wake for my aunt, like, let's do something like that for my, my dog. So a couple examples, um, you know, I interviewed one couple um, who lost their Yorkie and the wife, um, she's Jewish, and they decided to sit Shiva basically for the Yorkie. And so they had, you know, friends came over, family came over. I think even like the mail carrier came by because he and the dog <laughs> always had like this relationship. They, they, I mean, that's its own yes. special bond right there. Exactly. But it was, it was a really nice thing. And it was just like, okay, this is what we would do for anybody, a human person in our family that we love. So why wouldn't we do this for our dog? Um, you know, I, I spoke to people who did have like wakes or sometimes, you know, you know, they would have people come by either maybe the night before the animals euthanized to kind of say goodbye, which is like a living wake, I guess. Um, or even after the animal has passed. And if, you know, other um, pets in the house can view the body as well, that could be really helpful for animals, you know, noticing the grief um, uh, or experiencing the death themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, there are pet cemeteries, which are really wonderful places. And I love going to pet cemeteries because I find them to be really joyful, loving places because every animal that's buried there, a person chose to have them buried there. There is no animal that's buried in a pet cemetery out of obligation. Um, it's because people wanted to celebrate them and have that space. Um, so one of the most beautiful ones I went to was outside Tokyo when I was visiting a friend who lives in Japan. Um, I sort of, for a while, every time I went someplace new, I would look up what pet cemeteries were in the area and visit them. And the one in Tokyo, it was, um, you know, in kind of the Buddhist tradition. So there were a lot of the small shrines and there were incense and offerings and flowers. The, the offerings were like little cans of cat food or squeaky toys and tennis mm -hmm. balls. But like the love that people had for their pets was just palpable. Mm -hmm. And I loved seeing how even in a different culture in a totally different part of the world, it's the same love that really comes through. Right. I mean, it really is like, sometimes it's hard to feel like you have anything in common with certain people all around the world. But like, this is one of those common denominators, right? It is like pure, unfiltered love. Yeah. Like a and pure like bond. One of my favorite things I learned in my research, too, is that um, often people who study the economy of different countries notice an increase in pet ownership as soon as a country becomes more economically stable and people have more disposable income, they immediately get pets. That's like always the first thing that people really think. Yeah. Because they because they love animals or because they feel like that is what you're supposed to do. I think it's <laughs> people love animals. And honestly, you know, there's something really comforting and special about having pets. Because because one question I kept returning to in researching and writing this book was, you know, why do we do this to ourselves? Right. You know, we don't have to have pets. You don't have to fall in love with this animal that then is going to die and it's going to devastate you when they die. Like you don't have to go through that, but clearly there's something so special and worth it about having pets that people do it and they do it over and over again. Like very few people I interviewed said, okay, I had one dog and the loss was so painful. I could never, ever go through it again. Most people eventually have another pet. Now, pets are so incredibly, you know, I mean, they're in general, they can be incredible. And I'm not just, yes, I have had dogs. I'm, I'm violently allergic to cats. I did have a cat growing up. Her name was Magic. And she lived until she was about 24 years old. Um, <laughs> at which point I was having violent allergic reactions to her because 
it had been become clear that <laughs> I was the person in the house who was allergic to her. But, um, you know, she kind of became my, my dad's cat when I left for college. Like they became this little duo. And I remember he was like, not, we, we were always like, dad's not a pet person. Well, guess what? Guess what I realized after that? Everyone is a pet person. <laughs> it's just about finding the right one. I came back from college and they had formed such a bond, my dad and Magic, that when she died, he was like, he was bereft. He was bereft for weeks on end. I mean, she became his little buddy. And I think he really liked that she was quiet, that she like, you know, kind of just sat there. She gave him companionship. She didn't judge, although she was a cat. She probably judged a little bit, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. couldn't verbally express that judgment. And so, you know, like what I'm wondering about the ways in which pets can help us grieve other losses. Like I want to talk about the healing nature of animals, because obviously like there are so many animals who are trained as, as pet as, as therapy pets right? Um, to help people who have been through trauma, uh, to help people who have been through other losses. Can you just like talk about the role that they can play there? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I got to interview um, a lot of people who have service animals or emotional support animals. And, you know, the like the story you shared, like so many people told me I wouldn't get out of bed if it wasn't for my, my animal. Um, and definitely when people have gone through significant losses, having pets is a really comforting thing. And I think, you know, it's like you said, pets don't, um, you know, they don't judge, well, except maybe cats. And they, um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they with all due respect to cats, yeah. they, ju they also judge. <laughs> right. I think that's why a lot of my friends who have cats love them. But um <laughs> you know, animals just listen, right? I mean, because they don't necessarily understand everything you're saying, but I, I do feel animals can really tell when their people are feeling down or upset or are sick, you know, sick like even, yeah. Yeah. Like when, um, you know, my, when my husband had COVID, our dog was very like protective of him and was like, like snuggling up with him in a way that he didn't normally do. And I think that, you know, animals in general sense this and you know they will sit with you and they'll provide you sort of physical affection and there are all these studies too about how petting dogs can like help release different like oxytocin and other great chemicals in your brain um, even watching fish swim around can lower your blood pressure and so I think that often being with animals helps people remember to be present and be in the the moment of now and appreciate the now as opposed to worrying about the past or worrying about the future and I mean that's why I love walking our dog Seymour is you know mm. I keep thinking about my to-do list and I get very frantic and worried and then we go for a walk and I just feel myself like exhale and calm down and when I'm feeling sad I think an animal can help you remember okay here's some really good things right here right now yeah it's it's true I mean I brought I brought the aforementioned Ziggy to my father's Shiva when my dad died um, it was three years after my mom had passed away and I just like, I had gotten Ziggy the, 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 a few months beforehand and I just couldn't bear, like, she was just like the most comforting, fuzzy, delicious presence. And I, I took her to the Shiva. She was yeah. like my, my support animal there. And, um, and I will never forget that. I remember someone saying, you want to bring a dog to the Shiva? And I said, I, 1 million percent, like, and <laughs> would just retreat into the corner with her. Uh, and so I feel like, you know, when those pets do die, you know, the loss can be just so deep and so profound. And so I'm curious if you can share with me, um, you know, beside some of those ideas, you know, for honoring a pet's memory, what about like caring for yourself after a pet dies? Like what have you learned personally and through your research about how people can find support for themselves, um, feel less like isolated in their pet loss after, you know, after yeah. they're going through this? So I think the most important thing is to make sure that you legitimize your feelings um, because a lot of people I talk to and I did this myself, you kind of internalize those comments of, oh, it was just a dog, just a cat. And so you're feeling this deep grief 
And then you're beating yourself up saying, I shouldn't feel this sad, or I didn't feel this sad when my, you know, great aunt died, you know, but you do. And that's okay. Because maybe you actually, you spent more time with your dog than you did with this other family member. So I think trying not to beat yourself up or tell yourself you should be grieving or feeling a certain way, I think just makes it worse and harder to move through your grief if you're also trying to stifle it or contain it. So giving yourself time and place to have those feelings. And then I think, you know, finding ways to reach out and connect with other people who do get it um, is really helpful. And like, you know, gathering photos to put together an Instagram or like Facebook album um, and posting that. I have several friends who've done it recently and they said they found it really cathartic and nice to kind of go through their phone and find their favorite pictures of their their animal and curate this this photo album to share. Um, I had another friend who, when her cat died, she actually asked people to share memories of um, the cat with her. And people were sharing stories she didn't even know about her own cat, like from a time that someone, like a friend, was cat sitting. And so she collected all those and put them in a scrapbook for her daughter. And I think those things are really nice because it makes you connect with other people who get it and can show their sympathy yeah. and, and understanding but then it also gives you time and space to reflect and, and think about these things I also um, my friend Karen Fine who wrote a great book called The Other Family Doctor that just came out she has a great resource on her website about writing a obituary for your pet which I think mm. is a great exercise because it helps you go through and really think like what were your favorite memories and it helps you put it all in one place so then yeah. even 10 20 years from now you can read that and remember some of these special things so yeah are there are there places are there places online where they will publish a pet obituary there are some websites that are like specific to pet memorials and mm -hmm. actually for my book i started this instagram account where i've been posting people's tributes to their pets as well which i like to call a virtual pet cemetery um, and then there are some actual newspapers um, and magazines that will publish pet obituaries as well though sometimes there is sort of tension um with people not wanting an animal obituary next to the obituary for their sister or you know whatever it is but um there are some places that specifically will publish pet obituaries that are great and the you know like the like the not just like the good news the reality is is that we're living in a world in which we have very low touch ways of sharing you know asking people to witness Mm -hmm. our pets witness our we could do it on any social media platform we could do it through email it doesn't have to be in a newspaper next to a human obituary there are other ways in which we can do this um you talked about a vigil that is on zoom every month can you just share a little information about that in case folks want to find it yes um it's wonderful it's called perfect pause pet ministry okay and it was started um, through an Episcopal church in Danvers, Massachusetts, though so they moved to Zoom um, during COVID. And now they have people from all over the world, like yeah. there, there are people from Australia who tune in. Yeah. Um, so it happens the third Sunday of each month. And um, it's a time just to celebrate pets, but then there are always, um, you know, times to uh, remember pets who have died or pray for pets maybe who are sick. And it's just a really nice space, I find, to find other people who really get mm -hmm. it. Like if you're crying because your dog got another bad cancer diagnosis and you don't know what to do, it's a really wonderful community that's super supportive. And it's not just during the Zoom meetings, but there's a Facebook group where people can be in touch and people email all the time. And, you know, it doesn't matter where you live. I think one of the best parts about the internet is you can find <laughs> people pretty right. easily. So um, I can right. put information for you to post. Well. Thank you. Yes. Um, and we're, we're almost done, but I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question for EB or a comment, if you'd like to share the name of your pet, uh, be they living, be they dead, please share them in the comments section. Uh, we are both big pet people. Uh, EB, how many pets do you have at home right now at this moment? Well, currently um, we have Seymour, <laughs> the third dog. He is a okay. Chihuahua pit bull mix. And then I have two pet tortoises, Terrence and Twyla. And then <laughs> my husband has a fish tank, um, which is about a dozen African cichlids in it. And then we also have a small flock of pigeons that we rescued. From. Wow. Yeah. I didn't see that one coming. That was, yeah. that was, <laughs> 
that's amazing. You really yeah. are a menagerie. You, yeah. I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that sentence to you. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. You have a flock of pigeons. Mm-hmm. Where do they? Where do they live? Where does the, where's the flock? Are they just they just keep coming back or? No, so they're actually all um, what are called fancy pigeons, which are sort of designer <laughs> breeds that p- pigeon fanciers breed. And we um, adopted them from various animal rescue organizations in Massachusetts, yeah. found them and sur- or surrendered them. So they live outside. We have a loft for them. It's sort of like a chicken coop in a way, um, but it has like a bigger fly area. Um, so they live outside and they hang out and, you know, it's it's another fun way to have animals in your life yeah I mean I think that's great also because it just shows that like when you think of pets like we're really not just thinking about dogs and cats right a pet can be anything that you can kind of legally (laughs) legally own especially in the United States I mean my friend's son he loves snakes he has seven pet snakes his favorite one is a boa named Frank Sinatra you know and when one of the snakes died they had a full-on you know burial for him and they did the entire you know they had a whole right and rituals they did have a shiva for this snake and so i think it's also like um i would say like my one of my last questions is let's talk about kids you know in the mix you know this can really be kids first experience with death um it's it's a fact you know i mean i have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old and ziggy um if all things you know go according to how they're supposed to ziggy will 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 pass away sometime while there are still children. Um, and it's going to be a tough thing for everybody. It's going to be the first, you know, I think maybe real profound loss that they've had. And it's going to be a teaching lesson also for me as their mother um, on what grief feels and looks like and also how to model what what grief can look like, right? I mean, what any suggestions for people who have kids at home and who are dealing with pet loss? Yeah, that's that's a great question and, and one people ask me a lot. And I would say definitely try to just be as honest as you can with your kids. I can't tell you how many adults I interviewed for my book who still shared traumatic stories. They were still upset about lies their parents had told them about mm-hmm. pets that had gone to farms or, you know, a replacement animal that was tried to pass off as the original. And I would say try not to do any of that. I know it can feel tempting to like pretend the death didn't happen to protect your kids. But honestly, I think being really straightforward with them, answering their questions about, you know, what happens to your, the animal's body, if it's put in the ground, you know, where does their soul go? Um, You know, what happens to them next? Uh, Will I see them again? You know, and, and answering in what is aligned with your own religious beliefs or spiritual practices. But I think just being really honest and straightforward. And then I think also modeling grief and not being afraid to show um, your own feelings. Like I always remember when we had to euthanize um, my childhood dog, Gus, when I was 18, my dad sobbed like Gus and him were best friends. They went fishing together and my dad was devastated. And I remember feeling my own grief was so much more validated because I saw a parent grieving so intensely for a pet as well. So I think, um, you know, not hiding how you feel is a great way to have your kids realize, okay, I feel pretty sad about my pet's death and that's okay because look, my mom feels sad too. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it is one of like, it's a very sad reason to have a lesson but it's such an important lesson i mean we need to be honest with children about life cycles about the fact that you know they they didn't just go to a farm you know like they they died and it it does model healthy grieving for kids because when they lose somebody in their life at a certain time it's going to remind them that like it is normal to look sad and feel sad and nothing that I'm feeling is abnormal I've seen this before I felt this before and that is what we so badly need to do with kids which is model healthy grieving um EB thank you so much for talking to me about about all of this today you're you're a real font of information and it's so clear that you're such a obviously you're a pet lover but you're 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 a respecter and an appreciator and you know you're a curious mind when it comes to um how so many different cultures honor them and and love them and i think it's 
it's just a wonderful thing that you're doing in the world, documenting all of this. Oh, well, thank you so much, Rebecca. That that means a lot to hear. And, you know, I always kind of wished when I had pets die that I had an encyclopedia of options to turn to. So I, I hope that this book can kind of be that for people. I hope so too. Thank you so much again to Evie Bartels for talking to us about pets. Check out her book, Good Grief on Loving Pets Here and Hereafter. I am Rebecca Sofer from Modern Loss, and this has been Light After Loss's April edition uh, on National Pet Day. I wish you and yours a beautiful National Pet Day, um, whether it's currently with or in memory of a very beloved pet. And again, please feel free to put their name in the comment section. Uh, please check out other Light After Loss episodes. There are so many to look at on the 1-800-Flowers Facebook account, and I will be seeing you next month. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.